Thank you for standing by and welcome to ARM's third quarter fiscal year end 2024 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen to only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star one one on your telephone. To remove yourself from the queue, you may press star one one again. I would now like to hand the call over to Head of Investor Relations, Ian Thornton. Please go ahead. Thank you, Latif. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Thornton, and I'm the Head of Investor Relations at ARM. I would like to welcome you to our earnings conference call for the third quarter of the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. I'm joined today by Rennie Haas, the Chief Executive Officer of ARM, and Jason Child, ARM's Chief Financial Officer. Hopefully you will all have downloaded and read the shareholder letter. If not, it is available on the ARM Investor Relations website at investors.arm.com. The shareholder letter provides a rich update on our strategic progress in the quarter. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that during the course of this conference call, ARM will discuss forecasts, targets, and other forward-looking information regarding the company and its financial results. While these statements represent our best current judgment about the future results and performance as of today, our actual results are subject to many risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from what we expect. In addition to any risks that we highlight during this call, important risk factors that may affect our future results and performance are described in our registration statement on Form F1 filed with the SEC on September the 14th, 2023. ARM assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements we speak only as of the date they are made. In addition, we refer to non-GAAP financial measures during the discussion. Reconciliations of certain of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable GAAP uh, financial measures and a discussion of certain projected non-GAAP financial measures that we were not able to reconcile with our unreasonable efforts and supplementary financial information can be found in the shareholder letter that we released earlier today. The shareholder letter and other earnings-related materials are available on our website at investors.arm.com. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Rene, who has some prepared remarks. Thank you, Ian, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'd like to just make a few different uh, comments about uh, the quarter, and then I'll turn it over to Jason for some, uh, some specifics, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to Q&A. We had an outstanding uh, third quarter uh, inside the company. We could not be more pleased. Um, record revenues, uh, we exceed the high end of the range for the guidance and uh, extremely pleased about results overall. For Q4, uh, we're expecting a, uh, another record quarter. And to that end, we've also raised guidance of which uh, Jason is going to give more color on. But a little bit uh, regarding the why and, and, and how we got here, ARM is the most fundamental foundational pervasive compute platform really in the, in the history of digital design. Over 280 billion units uh, in the 30 plus years that ARM has been a company uh, have been built. And that has underpinned a software ecosystem and hardware ecosystem like no other. And given the fact that a CPU design is really driven by the hardware and the software, it creates a flywheel for continuous development. That is, the more hardware that exists on ARM, the more software that's written for ARM, the more software that's written for ARM, the more popular the hardware. So we're building off a, a fantastic base that when we look at what happened in the last quarter, uh, not only did we see uh, growth driven by a number of factors, but growth that we think is long-term and sustainable. For royalties specifically around some of the products that shipped in the quarter, We've seen a significant transition now continuing from our V8 product to our V9 product. Our V9 product garners roughly 2x uh, the royalty rate of the equivalent V8 product. And whereas in the previous quarter, uh, that was about 10% of our revenue for royalties, it's now moved to 15%. And that has seen growth in not only the smartphone sector, but also in infrastructure and other markets, which drives growth. We are also seeing uh, strong momentum and tailwinds from all things AI, from the most complex devices on the planet for training and inference, the NVIDIA Grace Hopper 200, to edge devices such as the Gemini Nano Pixel 6 from Google, or the Samsung Galaxy S24, more and more AI is running on more edge devices and uh, end devices, 
and that's all running on ARM. And what that has done is driven a very strong set of tailwinds for our licensing growth. When we look at demand for new products from a licensing standpoint, what we are finding from the end market is that we've reached nowhere near good enough relative to the capability of the technology and end customers for new designs are needing more and more ARM technology to keep up, particularly with the AI demands. So with that, our licensing growth has been very, very strong. We've also seen proof points around one of our strategies that we call compute subsystems. These are complete finished blocks of designs that we put together for our end customers that will save them significant time around validation of their engineering work and also around time to market relative to cycling products through the fab. One of the very first designs uh, that was made public that uses this is the Microsoft Cobalt, which uses our Neoverse cores, a 128 CPUs to be specific. We work very closely with Microsoft around these designs using compute subsystems. And we see this trend only going to continue. So between strong growth and royalties that are driven between V8 to V9, all things AI needing energy efficient compute and compute subsystems, we feel very, very strongly positioned for growth. And again, this is completely underpinned by a ecosystem of devices that are in the installed base and a very, very large software community that develops on ARM. So with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Jason and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you, Renee. I'm going to briefly touch on guidance for the fourth quarter and full year. Starting with revenues for fiscal Q4, we are guiding to a range of 850 to 900 million dollars with a midpoint of 875 million. This represents a raise of over 95 million dollars compared to our prior implied guidance for the fourth quarter. When combined with our strong Q3 performance, the full year revenue guidance rises to 3.155 to 3.205 billion dollars, an increase of 160 million at the midpoint versus prior. Within Q4, total revenue, we expect royalty revenues to grow mid single digit sequentially and to be up over 30% year over year as we compare against the bottom of the industry wide inventory correction that occurred in prior year Q4. Royalty revenue sequential growth is mainly coming from increasing penetration of ARM V9, where royalty rates are on average at least double the rates on equivalent ARM V8 products. Additionally, we are seeing an increasing amount of ARM technology and chips being deployed, and as the amount of ARM technology and chips increases, so does the royalty rate. With around 35% of ARM's total, <clears throat> sorry, ARM's royalty revenue coming from smartphones, we have benefited from recovery in the smartphone market. But with 65% coming from markets beyond mobile, we are seeing more revenue growth from share gains and market share growth outside of mobile. Additionally, we are expecting another strong quarter for licensing with revenue up sequentially to near record levels. As with recent quarters, we expect to sign multiple new ATA deals in Q4, and demand for our latest technology remains high as customers need access to AI-capable CPUs and related technology, such as our compute subsystems. Turning to expenses, we expect non-GAAP OPEX of approximately $490 million in Q4, and 1.7 billion for the full year. On a like-for-like -like basis, our full year guidance has increased by $10 million driven by slightly higher spend in R&D. As detailed in the guidance section of our shareholder letter, to increase transparency and improve the comparability of our results, beginning in Q4, the presentation of our non-GAAP measures will be modified to exclude employer taxes related to equity classified awards. These taxes are dependent on our stock price at the time of vesting, and as a result, fluctuate independently of the operating performance of our business. The impact of this change has been factored into today's non-GAAP Q4 and full-year guidance for operating expenses and fully diluted EPS. On an EPS basis, revenue strength will flow through to profit, driving Q4 non-GAAP fully diluted EPS up to between 28 and 32 cents, and full-year non-GAAP fully diluted EPS to up between a dollar twenty and a dollar twenty-four. In summary, we had an outstanding Q3 and expect our momentum to accelerate through Q4 and beyond. With that, I will now turn it back over to the operator to kick off the Q&A portion of the call. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one one on your telephone. 
to remove yourself from the question queue, please press star one one again. Please ask one question, then requeue with any follow-up. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Harlan, sir, of J.P. Morgan. Your question, please, Harlan. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon and congratulations on the strong results, guidance, and uh, of course, execution. Uh, December quarter, as you guys mentioned, right, second consecutive quarter of strong licensing, second consecutive quarter of book to bill greater than one, strong ECV. Sounds like many of your customers across all of your end markets are focusing on accelerated compute and AI and the requirements for more compute capability. And that's obviously being reflected in the strong licensing performance. How much of the expansion on recent licensing deals has been more about adding your AI specific IP, right? Like your ethos NPU or taking advantage of some of your helium and neon vector extensions for AI workloads or compute subsystems adoption versus just buying up the stack on more powerful cores. And then more importantly, like do you guys see the strong licensing momentum continuing into fiscal 25? Yeah, hi Harlan, thank you for the, uh, for the, for the kind words. Uh, I'll take the first part of your question and then, uh, and then let Jason comment uh, on, on the second half. One of the, one of the new products that, uh, that we released relative from a licensing standpoint is something we call ARM Total Access, uh, what Jason referred to as ATA. Uh, that gives uh, customers access to a broad set of ARM technology, including our most advanced CPUs and NPUs. And one of the things that we are seeing is exactly what you described. Uh, we're seeing demands for incorporating CPUs uh, with uh, anything that helps with AI acceleration, such as uh, vector extensions. Additionally, the ATAs give customers access to the NPUs, which they can also use for, for an offload. What we are seeing anecdotally relative to when we engage customers is that the need for more compute, the need to be able to handle what I would call a bit of the unknown relative to these uh, large language models that either run uh, on an edge device or in a hybrid way is fundamentally driving a need for more compute than they had before. So mm -hmm. they are looking to upgrade to give themselves flexibility on the design and also to maximize their ability to deliver the most efficient product, whether that's lots of different cores or a smaller set of devices that may or may not include an NPU. So in, in summary, yes, your, your question, um, I think, is accurate relative to the conclusion of AI demand is driving a need for a lot of different products. And I'll let Jason kind of comment to the, to the longer term trend that we see. Yeah, uh, Harlan, uh, I would say on the looking forward, so obviously I only uh, gave guidance for Q4. What, but but going beyond that, when you unpack licensing versus royalty, uh, you know because of the fact that we're largely you know almost entirely under contract for next year on on royalties, we feel good yes. about those trends. It's the it's the license piece that's a little harder to forecast. Uh, you know if I look at last quarter uh, and and this uh, and Q4 um, that's coming up, uh, we've definitely had some upside from AI and selling additional licenses. Uh, that were you know we're just not in our plan and not anticipated. Uh, so I think we're going to need to work through this quarter to find out how much of that upside continues to and, and that trend flows into next year, uh, because we, we've seen this demand has been coming I think a little shorter a little shorter sales cycles than we had seen with uh, you know typically before. So I'd say stay tuned. Very helpful. Uh, in 90 days we'll give you a, a better view. No oh, helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Gary Mobley of Wells Fargo. Your question, please, Gary. Hi, guys. Thanks very much for taking my question. And let me extend my congratulations to the entire ARM team for, uh, for the strong results. Um, can't help but notice the strength in business from ARM China. Maybe if you can speak to uh, you know, what, what drove that, that strong result out of Arm China? And uh, besides Arm China, were there any other greater than 10% customers in the quarter? Yeah, I would say bro broadly speaking, uh, we are seeing increased market share gains uh, for our products uh, across the board. 
particularly around automotive and infrastructure slash data center. Uh, you know, inside China, those are very good growth markets. Um, one of the things we've continued to uh, comment on relative to the China market is that the China ecosystem tends to follow the global ecosystem. So as we see the share gains uh, across different aspects of the market, uh, we're seeing that uh, consistent and holding true relative to China. And Jason, you want to take the uh, the other part of that? Yeah, just on the numbers, um, you know, to to make sure it's clear. So when we announce, you know, related parties, uh, I think we're about 30% of growth. Uh, Arm China is the largest portion of it. Uh, however, there are others. Uh, so Arm China was about 25% of total revenue, uh, just slightly up from the 20% from a quarter ago. That's helpful. The uh, gains in the royalty rate per unit, if I can add a follow on, um, certainly are accelerating. Is, is that all driven by ARM version nine? And should we continue to expect that upward inflection in the royalty rate per unit? Yeah, I, I think that's the right way to think about it. So uh, as mentioned, uh, ARM V9 uh, was 10% of our royalty revenue last quarter, now 15%. Um, we see that accelerating. Uh, the other thing we are seeing is that the mixes of devices that might have a mix of uh, V8 and V9 cores are increasingly moving to more V9 cores. Uh, and the reason for that is back to the AI comment, uh, the compute needs of the end applications only continues to increase. And what we're seeing is customers looking to put more and more technology uh, into their devices, perhaps even more than they originally planned for when they had licensed the technology. So it's a compounding effect of growth. We see growth from royalty happening from V8 to V9 transition and more ARM technology being used in the same devices. So it's a bit of a compounding effect that, that helps us with growth. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Thomas O'Malley of Barclays. Your question, please. Thomas. Hey guys, thanks for taking my question and congrats on the nice results. Uh, I just wanted to add um, a question to the, the, the V9 pile here. You guys are talking about traction in AI, smartphones, infrastructure. You're saying that that percentage as a, as a percentage of total revenue grows into the next fiscal year. Where are you seeing the most of that traction? You've called out AI a couple times here early in the call. But is that coming more from the smart the smartphone side or the AI side? And just maybe talk about the cadence of where you see uh, that penetration rate growing as you get into the next fiscal year. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Um, so a couple of ways to think about it. There, there's definitely growth coming from uh, the data center side. Uh, so proof points such as NVIDIA's Grace Hopper, uh, the Microsoft Cobalt design, the work that AWS has been doing with Graviton, what we are seeing is more and more AI demands in the data center, whether that's around training or inference. And because the ARM solution in the data center in particular is extremely good in terms of performance per watt, uh, and the constraints that are on today's data centers relative to running these AI workloads puts a huge demand on power, uh, that's a great tailwind for ARM. If we move to the edge devices, such as a smartphone, uh, We've seen, and I think the, the recent launches, as I mentioned, with uh, Gemini Nano and the Galaxy S24, uh, increased AI workloads being pushed to the phone. And what we're seeing from the design standpoint is more and more compute technology being pushed into those phones such that they are AI capable and AI ready. Uh, because this field is moving very, very fast. Uh, you know, a year from now, who knows what the type of AI applications that might be able to run on a smartphone. So what we're seeing is uh, a shift to more and more high performance capable technology to capture a wave to ensure that they can run these AI workloads. No, nobody wants to be caught behind with not enough performance when the new application comes out. So that is that has accelerated um, the V9 adoption, both from the standpoint of more devices using it and more devices using more of it. And to your question, you know, where is it coming from? Uh, it's coming from, from everywhere. Uh, it's coming from uh, certainly the data center, uh, certainly from the edge devices. 
and we think over time even AI PCs. And so it's a, a, a huge growth vector. Super helpful. And then if I could just ask a follow up as well, uh, if you look at kind of the seasonality to close year, you obviously saw you know really strong results in both the December and the March quarter. Um, you know, obviously you're not perfect with units, but if you look at June and the smartphone ecosystem, you're kind of seeing a little bit of a pause in the Android ecosystem and kind of some cautious data points um, from the from the supply chain in general. Could you talk about what you expect in terms of seasonality to start your fiscal year? Um, any tidbits that would be helpful? I know you're not guiding June, but uh, any way to help think about how we how we begin the next fiscal year would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to comment in terms of too far forward on the, the seasonality component uh, to what we're doing. But what I would emphasize is that um, we're a bit of a different company to think about relative to how you think about other companies in terms of their specific exposure to a market. We, we are involved in just about every single end market. And every single end market is moving from V8 to V9, which have, as I said, double the royalty rates. And just about every single one of these markets is putting more compute into their devices. So sometimes when, when we, we've had questions from folks saying, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, how units match up to, to numbers, we're operating on a little bit of a different plane uh, because of our broad, broad adoption. And as I mentioned at the start of the call, the pervasiveness of the architecture, it's just driving a whole different set of growth vectors. Thank you very much, Gus. Thank you. As a reminder, please limit yourself to one question. Our next question comes from the line of Vivek Arya of Bank of America Securities. Your line is open today. Uh, thanks for taking my uh, question. I just wanted to clarify, Renee, is this uh, on the V9, is the 10 to 15% related to number of customers, number of chips, or revenue related to those chips? Because I think uh, um, in, in the shareholder letter, it's uh, qualified as uh, you know, V9 of 15% uh, of royalty revenue rather than, um, so I guess the bigger question is, um, just so that we have an apples to apples um, sense of how many of your smartphone units are actually using V9 right now versus uh, you know, the ones that use V9 in, in the last quarter, is that a better way to track V9 uh, adoption? And yeah, where does so it go from here, I guess? Yeah, so so let me let me let me try to answer your question, and and maybe Jason, Ian, if I if I'm missing some facts, you guys can fill in. Um, first off, uh, the number when we say 10% and 15%, that's percentage of our overall royalty revenue. So that's that's the way to think about that. Um, when when you think about the number of units that are moving from V8 to V9, I don't think we have anything specific that I can give you on this call. But what I can tell you is just as a uh, an example or a, a, an anecdote is that V9 is being used extensively and almost um, uh, exclusively now in all the premium smartphones. And the premium smartphones, such as the Galaxy S24, uh, those are actually part of the segments that are seeing a little bit better growth than their um, compatriots. So given the fact that virtually all the premium smartphones have now moved to V9, and as I mentioned before, uh, people are trying to put as much V9 technology in that smartphone to capture the AI wave. I think that's maybe one way to think about proportionally where some of the growth comes uh, versus units. What we, what we tend to see with um, the smartphone market, for example, is typically a waterfall over time where what was in the premium unit finds its way into the, the high end, then into the mid-range. Um, but that's the way, I, maybe a good way to think about it in terms of you know, where the percentages are. There certainly is a lot of V9 in the premium smartphone, and we're seeing a lot of premium smartphones being sold. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Mehdi Hassini of SIG. Your question, please, Mehdi. Yes, uh, thanks for taking my question. Just actually as a follow-up, is there any way you could elaborate on a mix of V9 by end market, like a smartphone versus cloud compute? And I have a follow-up. Um, I'll, I'll attempt to answer that. And again, maybe, um, you know, uh, Ian and, uh, and Jason, um, as I said, pr premium smartphone is almost exclusively now V9 and virtually every high-end data center chip uh, is V9. When you look at Grace Hopper, uh, when you look at Graviton, when you look at Microsoft Cobalt, uh, 
uh, these are all V9-based designs. Yeah, the only okay. thing I would add um, I, on a in terms of you know royalty revenue and then chips that have actually been deployed uh, in the in the market, we are overweighted towards smartphones on V9 primarily because it's an annual refresh cycle, and so I would think of that being a bit ahead. Uh, over time, I think the other uh, lines of businesses will catch up, but but it's predominantly or definitely weighted more towards smartphone for the reasons that Renee just pointed out on premium mix. Got it. Thank you. And my follow-up has to do with the um, the market share. I think uh, end of FY24, or I'm sorry, end of FY23, cloud was about 10% market share for you, and networking was 26%. Um, is there any way you can give us an, uh, uh, some color as how, as you close FY24, how those market shares are changing? Yeah, not not to, not today. Uh, we're not prepared to give that. When we give the updates for uh, for next year, the next quarter, uh, we can we can do that. Uh, but I, I can say we're very pleased about the direction of travel, uh, and AI has only helped that uh, grow faster. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of DJ Rakesh Amazuro. Your question, please, DJ. Yeah, hi, uh, congratulations again on a great quarter. Um, just a quick question on the cloud compute side, if you could give us some way of how to look at what do you think would be the growth in 2024, given you, know, you have some pretty market customers with GS200 and Graviton and Cobalt 100 now, and a follow up. Sorry, uh, didn't catch the question. You're, you're asking about projected growth for next year in cloud? Yeah, yeah, just for calendar 24, how do you see the growth uh, with those on the cloud compute side? Um, with, with, you, have some, you have some big lucky customers there now. How do you see that growth? Yeah, as Renee just mentioned on, on the, for the last question, we'll, we'll provide our market share update uh, on specifically on, on compute, which is for us almost all cloud uh, in infrastructure. And we'll provide some, some views and we'll expect that to go next year. Uh, so, so give us 90 days. Got it. And then on the on the mobile side, obviously uh, you mentioned good traction uh, with V9. Just wondering what the penetration rate on V9 is now. When you look at the premium phones, uh, I guess all of it. But um, how how what the uh, you know what the projection on that is uh, through the year, I guess. Maybe you save it for later. Is your que is your question um, what percentage of smartphones are V9? Yeah. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, the numbers are somewhat skewed relative to the, the premium segment versus the broader segment. Uh, if you look at overall units, um, most of the premium, if not all, smartphones have moved to V9, uh, and the rest of the, the rest of the segments have been have been slower to adopt. But the premium segment draws a very very large um, mixture of lots of cores and and lots of royalty rich cores. So it tends to it tends to uh, weigh out the numbers relative to overall units. We expect V9 and Ian keep me kind of comfortable on this. Usually, next three four years to kind of find its way throughout the entire smartphone category. Yes, yeah, so if you go back to um, how V8 um, sort of took over from V7, um, it, it took about about three years to get from where we are here to about 80, 80 90 percent penetrated. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ross Seymour of Deutsche Bank. Your question, please, Ross. Hi, guys. Thanks for asking the question. Congrats on the strong result and guide. I wanted to go back to the Arm China conversation. Uh, so a, a clarification of the main question. The clarification was that 25% that I think, Jason, you mentioned, was that of total revenues or just of royalties? And then the main question is, could you just help us break down a little bit how that's so strong, you know, whether it's total revenues or just of, of royalties, that was a significant driver of growth. And, you know, depending upon the answer to the clarification, it could have been more than all of the sequential growth. So I just wanted to get my arms around what was really driving the growth and, and how much of it came from our in China. Yeah, China was 25% of total revenues uh, in Q3, and that's up from 20% in Q2. And then what, what was driving that? Because again, by that math, it seems like 
the China side was up, you know, I don't know, 30 percent and everything else kind of went down a little bit sequentially. Was, was that just the China handset market coming back to life? Was it more goodness beyond that? Just any color you could give on, on what drove that China growth that was so impressive. Yeah, we, we don't we don't break down the individual customers. Uh, but as I said, um, the China ecosystem tends to follow uh, the rest of the world relative to the growth. So when we talk about growth in data centers and we talk about growth in automotive, and to your comment, you know, certainly recovering the smartphone market helps. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Charles Shi of Needham and Company. Please go ahead, Charles. Hey, thanks. Uh, my congratulations uh, to our management team on the very strong results, very impressive. Uh, I do want to uh, dig into a little bit more on the on the China and the related party uh, side of the of the revenue because when I look at your historical numbers, uh, your ARM China contribution tracks almost identical the the related party transactions. There seems to be a little bit of uh, the gap seems to be expanding a little bit over the last quarter and maybe r related uh, to that. Um, you had uh, very strong bookings in the last quarter, and uh, this quarter the booking actually comes down a little bit, but the licensing revenue actually was stronger than you expected. Was that the result of uh, some of the earlier commencement of the, the licensing contracts that you probably signed a little bit earlier uh, in the year, maybe in the prior quarter? And is that the more of a timing that kind of surprised you to the upside? Thanks. Yeah, so first on the uh, on the related parties. So yeah, typically China has been most all of it. We did have uh, an additional license deal, uh, you know, that was roughly 5%, I guess, of total revenue, the difference between, you know, Arm China and the rest. Uh, that, that, that deal did uh, come through this quarter. Um, and so you're right, that's not something that's been continuous, but, but was, was a deal that came in this last quarter. In terms of the makeup of license revenue in general, um, you know, we, we typically run somewhere around 40 to 50% of our license revenue is from backlog, the deals previously signed, but, you know, relate to technology mm -hmm. milestones that are delivered within the quarter. And then the remainder are new deals that are signed within the quarter. Clearly, we have good uh, visibility into backlog and what our delivery is going to be. And we have a pretty good uh, insight into you know, renewals or deals that have relatively long lead times. I think the, the one thing that we saw a little bit uh, unique both last quarter and this quarter is with the increased kind of focus in AI and, you know, there, there just is, is a lot of focus on um, investing and building designs uh, in AI. And, and I, you know, I said, so there's been some shorter cycle deals that have come up uh, kind of, um, I would say, a little bit unique versus what we've seen in the past. And, and that's the primary reason why we do need to spend a little more time this quarter to get our, our arms around how much of that momentum will we continue to see next year. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Um, if I may add that the China piece, uh, your IP peers seems to be a little bit more cautious about uh, what, what's going uh, to, to happen, I mean, in this year, and actually the, the, the kind of cautious you started uh, late last year, but that your, your, your China revenue is still going very strong. How do we reconcile the differences here? I mean, this, this is my last question. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say that we're less cautious. I think our numbers have been strong, but from a forecast perspective, we, you know, we, we've been forecasting that China likely goes down into the teens uh, as a percentage of total revenue. Um, you know, this this last quarter and the quarter before, you know, we, we've just seen stronger recovery uh, than we had previously expected, and um, you know, and that's that's been certainly you know a, a nice positive surprise uh, in terms of you know going forward. We feel good about uh, the progress we expect to deliver this quarter, and you know, in 90 days, we'll let you know if we think that progress is going to continue into next year. Appreciate the color. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Matt Ramsey of TD Cohen. Please go ahead, Matt. Um, thank you very much, guys. Um, good afternoon. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the uh, the ARM B9 conversation on on a couple of points. I, I noticed that 
this is the first time, and maybe I'm just dumb and didn't see it, but um, I think this is the first time you had explicitly put um, in the shareholder letter and in writing that, that you were at least double royalty rates from, from V8 to V9. And I guess I wanted to ask you about that in, in a broader sense. Is, is that sort of across the board, um, across end markets, and also across customers that are traditionally processor licensees and, and also ones that are traditionally architectural licensees and do the systems themselves. Um, so, so I guess that's the first part of the question. Is, is that a, a blanket statement across the board? And, and the reason I ask it, if you go back to lots of conversations around the IPO timeframe, there were some uh, aggressive ramps of royalty rates across your mobile business. And, and I think we were all trying to figure out whether the VA penetration to V9 would, would drive those kind of expansion and results, or, or if you would need some significant contributions from sort of total system license and the like to, to get those results. And, and so any context there about the applicability and breadth uh, of, this, of that comment on, on doubling royalty rates on V9 would be really helpful. So thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So I'll, I'll attempt to, to answer it and uh, let let Jason and, and uh, if Jason wants to, to chime in. Uh, yes, you're right. This is the first time we've done it, um, although we only have done two of these letters, so we don't have a huge installed base to refer to. We wanted to provide some specific clarity uh, because we had you know had been receiving some level of questions about the thing you just asked about relative to how to think about V8 versus V9. Um, the, the double the V9 uh, rate for the equivalent, dub, double V9 for the equivalent V8 is, is sort of a rough guidepost, but in some cases it's quite a bit more. Um, the, the Neoverse royalty rates have their own unique tables. The automotive royalty rates have their own unique tables. And some of the most high performance CPUs that we ship into the client section have uh, very, very um, significant lifted rates over uh, version eight. So. Double is a is a good rule of thumb uh, for like for like, but in some cases it's, it's even better than that. Um, so that's but we did want to sort of provide just some clarity because we thought when 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 folks looked at the numbers in the absence of that context, there would just be a question of just help help me work out how you got here. So Jason, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on to that. No, I think you know to Renee's earlier point, we're. I understand we're a little bit hard to model because we don't really track to other companies. Uh, and you know, because of, you know, we're what, getting paid royalties on roughly 8 billion chips a quarter uh, and just the slightest bit of, of mix, either to you know, more premium handsets or to more V9 versus V8, uh, that turns out to be a pretty sensitive variable. Uh, and you know, when you look at the growth from last quarter to this quarter and what we're expecting from this quarter to the next quarter, unit growth is, is very, very small. It's really almost all coming from rate growth increases and as we said back at IPO, we're you know almost 100% on a contract uh, for next year. So so really we're just seeing the manifestation of the work that was done in the last two years. Um, we wanted to provide this V8 to V9 ratio as one way to help you guys be able to kind of see the progress and be able to model it. So so hope it's helpful. No, it's, it's super yeah, helpful. I can say that you know, one thing. One thing that we had high confidence in when we started looking at the transition was VH V9. We knew we had um, uh, increased rates, uh, and we knew that the royalty picture would be better than what uh, we were accustomed in the, in the in the past. I think one of the benefits we're getting, and I, I would use AI as sort of a uh, a driver for all this, is that uh, the amount of V9 cores or the mix of V9 cores um, has been stronger than anticipated. Uh, because people are putting mo more CPUs down uh, where they were not planning on putting as many, or they may be putting a higher mix of V9 and V8. So that's that's all driven, I think, good forward momentum for us. Oh, that's super helpful, guys. Just a quick clarification. Any any comment on? I mean, the, the base rates may be different, and obviously different customers have different contracts. But all of that commentary, at least directionally applicable to your your architectural licensees as well. Thanks. Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Andrew Gardiner of City. Your question, please, Andrew. Uh, thanks very much for taking the question. I, I had one on the licensing side. 
you guys have spoken about you know how strong it was in the quarter and the you know, sort of being surprised at the the quicker sale cycle time on some of these licenses. Um, a point that you haven't brought up on the call yet, but that was in the shareholder letter was that you also saw three of the five um, ATA licensees in the quarter be upgrades from the Arm Flexible Access program. And you said that was the first time that had happened. Did, did that take you by surprise or were these customers that were you know, getting to be particularly you know, large for an AFA and so it was natural for them to upgrade? Um, yeah, is, is it, was it a surprise and is this something that might actually continue to surprise positively? Right? Is there a, a portion of that, you know, that cohort that is sort of natural to be upgrading from AFA to ATA and therefore contribute more in terms of license dollars? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we didn't bring it up in our comments. We've got a lot of good stuff to talk about this quarter and uh, I was trying to keep it as concise, but the, uh, the AFA uh, transition to ATA, thank you for calling that out. That's a great trend for us. Uh, when we designed the program uh, a number of years ago, uh, that was absolutely the intent, is that customers that launched into an AFA would ultimately go on to a total access license. What largely drives that, quite frankly, is you know, the, the, the companies that the AFA start to get commercial traction in their business. Um, some of the AFA customers are early stage companies. They you know, may have an early exit or, or get acquired, but as they get larger and mature, uh, we expect them to embrace ARM technology in a broader way. So I wouldn't call it a surprise. I would actually call it uh, an expected outcome um, that we have and we're, happy, we're really happy to see it. It's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. I would now like to turn the conference back to Renee Haas for closing remarks. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, everyone, for, uh, for the kind words on, on the quarter um, and uh, um, the good set of questions that we had. We're thrilled about Q3, uh, and we're very, very excited about Q4. I think what you're seeing coming to life are all the strategies that we've been working hard on over the last number of years, uh, investment in the V9 technology, the diversification of our business into data center, into automotive, and also, of course, IoT. And then now the, what I think is probably the most profound um, opportunity in our lifetimes, which is around a AI. And I think regarding AI, particularly when you think about artificial general intelligence, that's going to drive the need for more compute in a way that we've never seen before. So uh, as good as the last couple of quarters were, uh, we're just at the beginning. Um, I could not be more excited about the growth that we have going forward, and thank you for all your time and questions. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.